so we'll get going. Okay, good morning everyone. There's a few more people still putting in with their teas and coffees, but that's okay. Um, welcome to the ULCC user group meeting, formerly known as the Mug E and Mug I don't know, but we are now all together H E and F E because we're all customers of um, ULCC, as I am. I'm Sarah Sherman, I work for the Dreams. Um, and we share a Moodle infrastructure which ULCC hosts. So it's been my great pleasure to be chairing this meeting, um, which I think I've been doing now for two years, something like that. It's very important, I think, from a custom point of view that we have this opportunity to discuss and share and lobby and complain and cheer all the work that ULCC are doing. I think it's quite a unique um, opportunity for us as customers to really feed into their development. So really use the opportunity today to talk to fellow customers and to ULCC members of staff. Talking of which, if you work for ULCC, can I ask you just to stand up? Standing. Okay, so we have Emily, who I'm sure you all know, so she'll be speaking in a moment. We've got Richard, who's sort of development guru. I'm sure a lot of you have interacted with Richard. And Dave, who's their boss, so he's important. <laughs> um, and you'll be hearing um, from all of them. Um, in sort of putting the, the agenda together, I've also been working with Patricia, who is representing the FE sector. So between the two of us, we make sure that what's on the agenda reflects all of your needs. And I think actually, um, Frank, who, sorry, I forgot, you as well. Upset at all. Frank. He's, he's basically <laughs> one of us as well. He helps to put the agenda together to make sure that all of your views and what you want from the agenda is met. So it's a good collaboration. So, um, <laughs> good. Um, there are no fire drills as far as I'm concerned or being warned, so if we hear anything we walk out in an orderly fashion and follow the ULCC members of staff. <laughs> Sounds like there's some building work going on but we will speak loudly and clearly. Um, we are also streaming live, so we've got some fellow customers who are out there in the wider world, um, Liam is looking after them, so if they have questions or anything they want to say, they're able to facilitate that and Liam will be their representative. So I think without further ado, let's start with Dave's um, feedback from the last user group. Good morning. Um, I just wanted to very briefly share with you some of the things we took from our last yeah. session, which was our, our first joint event. And apart from the cold in the room, was, was what we felt was, was one of the best events that we, we got an awful lot out of it. I hope you did too. So. I really just want to pick out two aspects of things. One is, one is, you obviously raise lots of questions, make make various comments during these meetings, and it gives us a lot to go away and think about. And one of the channels we're trying to respond to that with is is via our blog, our e-learning blog, which I think some of you may have seen and and had a read of, but. I want to kind of give you a flavor of the kind of things that we put on there, remind you of how to access it, and, and encourage feedback, comments, discussions actually taking place there so that we can continue these kind of conversations, not just once a quarter, but, but on a continual basis. So since the last meeting, there have been posts on reporting that's included as standard in our services, advice on theming, um, issues to do with 2.7 assignment changes in Moodle, lots and lots about 2.8 upgrade, of which there will be much, much more, um, Bloom Bonsai service levels, all of those kind of things as well. So I would encourage you to read it. The address there, for anyone who, who hasn't got it imprinted on their brain, el.blogs.urcc.ac.uk. We are uploading several blogs a month. Frank and Neua are our taskmasters in making sure that we, we keep adding to that number and, and increasing the frequency. So please do read them. The website, our main URCC website, will um, bring up a feed of recent blogs. Uh, Frank and Neua are on Twitter also. If there's an interest in new blog, they will publicize that there. So there's there's lots of ways to get get yourself onto that blog. Um, it does have the opportunity to log comments. Um, so 
it's happened a few times, but not in any great depth, but quite happy for a discussion to be started and and we will read and respond and um, have the same kind of interactions that we do here via that medium. Um, clearly, if we need to take something offline, we can, we can do that with yourselves. But <coughs> don't feel hesitant at all about commenting, questioning, as, as Sarah said, complaining, cheering, whatever, whatever fits. The other thing is, um, you're not meant to read this, by the way. This is meant to give a flavor of our thinking on roadmap. This group is one of the key ways of influencing our roadmap and for us to sanity check the roadmap that we're sending ourselves on. Um, we've been doing a lot of re work recently um, with Richard there and the development team about really trying to slightly shift the balance from where we have been, which is reacting to customer needs for development customization which in some cases reflects where our service doesn't have these things as standard and therefore our customers need to come to us and ask us to build them on top. Um, it's not to say we don't want to do that. There's always going to be need for customization, extension, tailoring, etc. But we want to shift the balance slightly more towards us being proactive, talking to you guys, understanding the features that you're going to need in the short, medium term developing those ahead of time and then the service has them ready for, for when you need them. So Richard and team have been doing a lot of work on, on a roadmap, both for the, the coming weeks, the coming months, and, and getting progressively more vague as we get further into the distance. But this is just a flavor of, of what's going on. On the right is things that the team are working on at the moment. Um, the middle is stuff that's planned and, and being lined up for future releases. And the third lot is a place to collect everything that we might do or need to think about further before we do. Um, but a brief summary of you know, where our top priorities are on that is really reporting it is something we've taken from this group as we need to develop that further. Um, and I know Richard next is going to talk about a workshop that he held and some of the discussions and thinking and planning we've got around reporting. Um, preparing everybody for Moodle 2.8, there's a lot of work we need to do to the, the product and the software to, to gear up for that and equally the infrastructure behind it. And archiving is, is probably next on the list. Um, now that we've been operating these services for a fair few years now, the question of what do we do about our older Moodle content um, that we want to keep around in some form or other is becoming more and more important. So that's that's something on our radar for the, the coming months. Um, these meetings, obviously, you can influence that. If you, if you don't like what you hear, if it doesn't sound like the right roadmap, then that's a conversation we want to have because we've um, we try to make those decisions based on what works for us and you and the whole the whole system. Um, we are looking to see if we can find a way of making some form of this digestible and presentable to you guys. There's a lot of tedious detail in there that I don't think is going to be particularly interesting. There's nothing secret in there, but um, it, we're looking at whether we can extract some some meaningful aspects of it to say here are the features, here's how we prioritize them, comment as you see fit. Um, and that's it really for me. Um, if anyone's got any burning questions, I yes. can... Any questions for Dave? Ooh, very bright that light. It's, this is a really great opportunity. We've got a question there. I, I think <coughs> when I say we're going to investigate ways of making this consumable by you guys, I mean, I think that's certainly something for us to consider if there's a relatively straightforward mechanism for us to do that. Um, but I'd certainly say this is an opportunity to, it's not a formal voting, but you can obviously make your voice heard to say this is something we think is important. I think that's a really and good suggestion. And maybe before there is a formal mechanism, maybe we can use the blog. So blog, absolutely. Use, I that, mean, use the commenting section of the blog. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be <coughs> sensible for us to use the blog 
to share our plans for reporting, archiving, etc. And then you have a chance to add to the discussion that follows on that, which which is a way of influencing. The other thing I can say about the blog as well is that you can subscribe to it. So there's the RSS yep. feed, so I get an automatic email every so often when something's posted. But also, as Dave said, Lure and Frank forward posts to the user group mailing list as well. So there shouldn't really be an, uh, a missed opportunity to see what yep. they posted. And if we're missing the boat on the content or the tone, the information, the anything, then please feedback here or, or any other form. Any other questions That's today? It. Okay, well, he's going to be here all morning, yep. afternoon, so yep. do make sure you speak to him if you have anything to ask him. So, I'm going to now hand over to Richard, who's going to tell you a bit more about the reporting workshop that Dave mentioned earlier. Okay, so, morning everyone. Um, a couple of weeks ago, based upon primarily feedback from this user group, plus a few others um, that haven't attended. I ran a reporting workshop to kind of find out what do you actually want from reporting in Moodle and is anything actually missing? Uh, it was focused around a small group of users who had previously suggested that they were interested in reporting in Moodle, primarily because um, I like to keep workshops reasonably small so everyone gets a chance to um, have some real value input. I've taken some of the requirements that have been fed into that and I'm working on it at the moment. But it was also a chance for us to discuss kind of direction on what we felt reporting should be as part of the OCC service. So it's working together essentially. But one additional benefit from those who attended, I, I noticed throughout the day that everyone seemed to like the, the sharing collaboration, not just on reporting, but also hearing about what everyone's doing internally. So um, an example of that was University of International programs here at, at the university uses Cognos for wider reporting um, outside of Moodle. So it was interesting to hear some thoughts on that. Uh, key findings were essentially that reporting that is available in Moodle already is just too basic, so there is a tool necessary to do the job here. Um, that any tool that's created should be available under the Moodle menu system, so it shouldn't be hidden away or put in some extra access somewhere else. It should be available in the same places as everyone's used to at the moment. Um, institutions should be able to customise their own groupings of reports, so this seems to be reasonably important in the sense that having a default category for a report isn't always very intuitive and people like to customise that. Uh, the main point that um, so adding graphs in, into place, which some of the tools that already exist do, um, some of the ones we've written in the past don't, and Moodle hasn't traditionally always been very good at visualisation of data either. Um, equally alongside that, it's quite important to get the interface correct. Um, there are, as you're all aware, parts of Moodle that's quite clunky, so um, if we can do anything here in regards to having a decent UI would be good. Um, there was a suggestion made around having reports to have a large flexible set of filters that are available, possibly taking on some ideas from how Google Analytics works. Um, and equally for the use of reporting, being able to assign your own department, so setting your own departments for use in, in reporting, so possibly assigning these courses or these categories belong to this faculty or this group, um, and then being able to report based upon that set as well. Um, the next list of key findings were around that <coughs> every report should belong to a category or 
at least one category and uh, there should be a description available for those reports. It's not always useful to just be shown a list of data without knowing what it actually does. Um, it should also have its own role-based system so users themselves can, um, well, Moodle administrators can assign permissions to created reports. Uh, another point that was quite paramount throughout the session um, was that you wanted to create your own reports from the front end and being able to cascade those permissions down, as well as having it as part of standard service. So because Moodle itself doesn't provide enough reporting, um, any plugin that we develop um, should have some availability availability just as part of core service. And kind of consequently to that, if it's part of core service, it was found that most reports that are necessary don't necessarily need to be based upon completely live data. Uh, followed on by having the ability to have triggers for events. So um, if something's quite useful for a set of lecturers on a particular course that they get notified that something's changed in that report and to go and have a look at it. Uh, the final point on the key findings is that effectively some institutions find it quite difficult to download log data at the moment um, and take it to harness it yourself. So uh, that should be built in as well. So not just having the, the ability to access it from the front end of Moodle, but also being able to harvest and take away that, that log information <coughs> yourself as well. Um, there was some, some reports that we identified in particular user groups. Um, students was one of them, and we found that effectively the main things that, that they potentially could be interested in is having a grade and feedback overview, to, which they don't have at the moment, so across modules and courses, as well as the potential to benchmark their, their um, use of Moodle against other participants in their courses and modules. So where they might want to put more of their attention to or um, potentially where they haven't viewed anything at all. Uh, lecturers, we found that they might ha be interested in seeing everything that the student sees, but more on a, a summative level um, with the ability to drill down as well as having a look at kind of the submission dates, uh, the total number of submissions that have been made to particular activity types, how many have been late in Moodle, and who hasn't submitted at all. Uh, alongside having a look at completions and badges to particular courses, so rather than having to be going into each individual course, you have a, a nice overview in front of you it kind of leads on reasonably nicely to making some intervention predictions based solely on Moodle data. So th this isn't going into a, a larger analytics system because that's that's kind of where you'd harvest this information out. But this, this might be, okay, so this student hasn't logged in or hasn't submitted anything at all. Should I chase them up? I, I probably need to know that information without having to go into the logs and checking or going into my list of users and checking who hasn't logged in at all. Um, at the last user group, it was mentioned from Sussex Downs, who was presenting, um, I think they're probably here today, um, that they'd also like some reports on individual learning plans. So that needs to be tied in for lecturers here as well. Uh, we, the findings for middle man managers was that they'd probably want access to everything that students and lecturers had access to, but on a kind of a more summative level with the ability to drop, drill down again, as well as being able to have a look at various department level reports. So 
how much are students accessing their courses in my <coughs> department? How, what interactions are they making? When are they making those interactions? Equally, teachers, are they accessing? What are they doing? Um, alongside how many courses that are being run in my department at the moment uh, versus the number of enrollments there. Uh, finally, um, it was identified that senior managers probably wanted to have access to some reports. So being able to have a summative view across departments and making a comparison between them. So looking at department X versus department Y and kind of benchmarking the engagement between the two. Um, the next steps which we have after this is for me to work on the requirements that came out a little bit more because there's quite a lot to do there to break it down for our development team to actually get started on it but also to communicate back um, to here primarily but also to those interested parties who were as part of the workshop as well as keeping you updated on the progress on the blog so it's in, in my uh, point of view, it's the most important action to come out of this user group since we've been running it. So having something developed is quite important. So I, I hope for the next user group that we run that I can show you something that we've actually done. Um, before I move on to the next part, is there any questions on reporting specifically? Yeah, so you're also seeing engaging with GIS, Learning Activities Network Initiative, which is aiming to create a toolkit for institutions, say, for student dashboard. What are the reporting tools? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 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 i am sorry i am sorry i am sorry i am sorry i the only engagement recently has been around, uh, I attended their assessment workshop um, uh, to do with what requirements are coming out. We haven't engaged specifically more recently around reporting, okay, so, so I'd be interested. Right. That sounds great. Um, if you want to, we can take this off offline yeah, up here we and we could, yeah. discuss it. Uh, sorry, uh, another. You, you presented the views there, the requirements from middle managers and senior managers yeah. and dashboards. Can I request that if you're going to do this, that you also get something <coughs> done on what students want in terms of reporting as well? Yeah, well, there was a slide on students reporting. Um, okay. The, the initial workshop was primarily based around coming up with some some starting requirements. So as we continue to develop this tool, whichever tool it may be, progress will be pushed out to those parties that are involved in the workshop and then have the opportunity to feed it back to students as well, alongside those that might Can be I interested. Can request in that what we don't do is, is think what students Need yeah. But actually, get, get them involved in day one and find out because if not, we can end up developing the whole load of institutional dashboards, which is yeah. like the senior management. But the, the student, we need to think about what our students want to access and embed that from day one. Yeah, it's a fair point. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take that on board. Uh, I'll have a think about that and how how we might kind of facilitate that, possibly working. I was about with... to say we might be able to help because we're right here. So yeah. we've got. You know, lots of students who will be around. Um, but yeah, that's that's really good. I mean, obviously, um, we we can't possibly have everybody involved in the small working group because it won't be a small working group. And, yeah. But I, this is, as far as I can see, working with ULCC, it's always work in progress. It's always evolving. So 
it's like an iterative process. So we say what we want, they'll have a go, come back, wireframe it. So it's, it's an ongoing dialogue. Um, but keep those thoughts coming, Neil and others, and, and use the blog. You know, you're going to blog when you're yes, so far indeed. along. So make sure you see that and comment and, and keep the discussion going. Um, any other questions? This, yeah. Where is this going to end up? Is it going to be standard in bonsai or bloom or only for tailored customers? Or? <coughs> It'd be, um, the idea would be that we'd have something that's standard for everyone to, to have access <coughs> as part of service. Excellent question. Are you for it and when, when are you planning to have something completed by? Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm currently working on the requirements at the moment and feeding that into our development backlog. So uh, I'd like to have something in version 1.0 for the next user group, but um, it depends upon um, what direction we go on, because I still need to go into a little bit more detail, if that makes sense, on those requirements, because it's very top level um, here. So design, etc. Neil? Very student question. Will, will the slides be available? Yes. Okay. And you notice there's no statement here saying, you know, copyright, don't tell the world yeah. type thing, which other providers <coughs> the, um, there's a the, it's, the session's recorded as well, so it's available online. So. And, and for us at the back of the room, if you could repeat the question for us and for the yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, good point. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. yeah. yeah. We'll repeat the questions as they come in for purposes of yeah, people. Are you guessing them? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay, we've got good mic systems here. Um, any other questions regarding reporting? Yeah? Um, from a system feedback perspective, that's what I do now, I guess. Um, we've been looking a lot at uh, getting lecturers to feedback properly on um, essays, but they were saying, students don't read the feedback. This may, this may happen already, we need to turn this in uh, for the most um, uh, submissions. Is there, are there plans, is there functionality existing already, so that we can report easily on where the students are interacting with the feedback lecturers are giving? Uh, or is that is that something you're planning to put into this? Does that make any sense? Uh, so, the, so the question was um, looking at students' interacts with assessment, is, is that effectively what you're saying for feedback? Yeah, because you are um, getting, getting lecturers to, to do that and, and to not just respond, well, what's the point? You know, they're not going to read it, they'll look at their grade and then move on. Yeah, well, so certainly um, that can be planned into as a, as a report for lecturers to have a look at particular activities, whether they're actually reading what, I, what a lecture is written on there. I, I think that's, that's a good idea. And specifically regarding feedback, I think at the next user group meeting, let's get um, IOE in to demonstrate yeah. their plugin that they had developed, which talks about that. So um, uh, to summarise what Sarah's just talking about is IOE wrote, uh, commissioned UOCC to, to write a report which gave a summative view of feedback and grades across courses, oh. essentially. So the individual students, so it's actually but yeah, we should we'll put that on the agenda for next yeah. time. Thank you. Emily has a question from the front. Oh, it was, it was just actually just to mention that I'm covering in uh, my presentation, but in 2.8, there is quite a powerful tool with event management. So um, it's something that I think as a group needs to be looked at in terms of actually setting up those type of reports. Mm. And I think it could be that granular to be able to email certain groups when certain actions in courses and, and activities. Um, we're still investigating it at the moment in terms of how powerful it is, but it is a, it is a new tool within 2.8 in terms of event, event management, which I think for an end user, if you're looking at you know, students and their interactions with assignments, um, that's going to give you something you could see for. Excellent. Um, can I just have a quick show of hands for the people who were at that reporting workshop? Okay, look around. So these are other people to talk to um, during the day to make sure that their view, your views are, are fed in. Um, brilliant. Rich is going to be around for the rest of the day, so any other specific questions, um, grab him Good. gently. Um, right, so he's going to stay here because the final <laughs> slot is to give you some feedback on the OCM, the online coursework management um, function that you've been working on. Yeah, sure.
So unfortunately, you're stuck with me again. Um, uh, for some time, um, UOCC have been working on a activity type in Moodle um, called coursework. It primarily mm. came about because Moodle itself doesn't facilitate double-blind marking, um, and it's a, a kind of a hot topic for our higher education customers. Um, but equally, it would apply to other educational sectors as well. So we've developed a tool which we think is, is a good start to that, uh, and it integrates with Turnitin. Blind marking and double marking because we have different meanings being used interchangeable at UAL. So, can you just clarify what you mean by blind? Um, it's an interesting point. Um, I actually think it's probably best. Um, Alistair from the RVC is going to be demoing uh, some slides after I start. So, it's probably that. Yeah. Um, so, so why were we developing it? Um, well, effectively, we've had some funding from higher education sector for some time. There have been multiple versions of it. Um, so traditionally, we've developed the tool for individual institutions and gone in five or six different directions. So now that we've got a number of universities that have shown interest in it, we've decided to develop something that will be more beneficial to the sector in general. Um, so we, we've made a release um, which we're calling version 1.0, um, which has some of the features which some of the universities that have used it previously, but not all of them, um, in part because, as I said, we're, we're trying to make a tool that's beneficial to all so that you can all have it as part of service rather than um, trying to maintain lots of different versions. And just to, before I hand over to Alistair to actually explain a little bit more about the tool, um, I just wanted to cover uh, a few other points. Later on today, um, I have a closed meeting with a few interested parties that have used the tool or shown interest in the tool later. Um, that doesn't mean that those that aren't invited can't have it or use it or feedback. It's just we're talking uh, a little bit later on the future of, of where the tool could go. Um, the, the, the version 1.0 plugin um, is, is available for everyone. So um, if you want to have a look at it, just request it and put the request into Service at London as you normally do. But now I'm going to hand over to Alistair from the RVC, who has been using version 1.0 as a pilot with students and teachers, and has gathered some feedback, which we'll hopefully talk about now. Thanks, Richard. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'm Alistair Spark from the uh, World Veterinary College. Um, and we've been uh, quite interested in, in this. Uh, so to give a bit of an overview um, of the timeline of this, we've um, switched from Blackboard to Moodle um, and switched off Blackboard in uh, 2012, in August, uh, October 2012, and migrated to using Turnitin um, for plagiarism detection for our summative assignments uh, as a policy, but still submitting paper copies. So. We had a strong interest from one of our academic leads to go paperless. Um, and so in March uh, 2013, we had a, an extra push on it and uh, found out uh, about the projects uh, led by Exeter uh, working with ULCC uh, in, in April and got in touch with ULCC shortly after. Um, we had some meetings with our, our registry and exam office on um, initial impressions of the tool and start gathering uh, some feedback in terms of what uh, capabilities we wanted to see which were there uh, and, and how it would fit in the RVC's um, exam workflows. And um, after 
uh, council meeting, uh, we had a, a meeting with, with uh, ULCC, uh, Mike Deering and, and, and some of the developers, uh, and wrote a use case uh, for the RVC's uh, requirements, um, and had some follow-up meetings which allowed us to then uh, get, your, get ULCC to, to make a bit more work on this so that it was ready to uh, stable enough for a pilot and, and, and fit our requirements. So uh, a few months, well, no, a few years later, we now um, um, ready, went, were ready to go live in, in January. Uh, we had our student deadline, which was uh, on Monday. And um, I'm happy to report that every student has submitted, um, haven't had any issues with that. And uh, we've released it to Marcus to start marking and um, we've already had two Marcus mark papers, so so far so good. Um, and we'll obviously report back with um, uh, some uh, feedback from uh, the pilots because we've uh, provided some um, pre-pilot and post-pilot surveys uh, of staff uh, to be able to assess uh, how best we can support staff in doing uh, migrating from paper to online marking, which is quite a big change. So the background was really that all summative uh, assessment had to go through, uh, submitted online by Turnitin, but we still had to do paper copies and online. Well, why can't we just go online, essentially? Um, and actually, dispatching paper is really time-consuming for the exam office, so can we go paperless? Obviously, the first choice is Turnitin, and Turnitin only supports single marking. Uh, no double, and then definitely no double bind. And Despite it being a request for more than five years, there's no indication that's ever going to happen. But definitely not at the, at the time. And we know how unreliable Turnitin can be. Um, so there was a lot of issues with Turnitin, which we knew um, we needed <laughs> something else to be able to address. So this is uh, back to the use case. This is the workflow we were going with of a student writing the paper, uh, checking uh, for plagiarism in a checkpoint, uh, and then submitting it this being dispatched by um, the exam office to the two markers, then the markers, uh, once they've both marked separately, coming to an agreed grade uh, over the phone, uh, and then the exam office being able to download everyone's agreed grades and going to an exam board. We don't advertise a certain market option, uh, which is on the side, but it's, it's there because technically it's meant to be there. But we, we don't advertise it to our own markers. So what does it do? Students submit online. Uh, we can grant individual extensions to students, which uh, was a big, big thing. And especially for our, our, our pilot submission is a very, students essentially submit throughout the whole 18 months. Uh, over an 18 months period and every student has a different different deadline because it's based on when they have slots for their research projects while they're uh, on place on rotations uh, placements um, to become vets um, and so so that that was quite a, a big deal um, so then we can manually allocate markers for each um, um, uh, first marker second marker for each student which so again we have a, a topical subject, so we want to be able to manually allocate someone who actually understands the subject, and the both markers can then go and mark their paper separately at convenient time. Once they've both marked, they done their initial marking, they can then uh, get in touch and agree a final grade, <laughs> and then the final grades can be exported, um, and then there's uh, options to release individual and general feedback, which we're not using for this pilot because. Um, the students will have graduated by the time they uh, they would be allowed to receive uh, the, the grades and feedback for this. Um, so we're, we're not doing it for the pilot, uh, but we have an, a, a second pilot with a different group of students <coughs> where we, we will look at the actual uh, release of feedback to students. So a quick demo. Uh, this is a student view uh, where they would go into the assignment, they see their deadline, and they can upload their submission. Um, they see the usual file picker for Moodle to be able to upload a file, and then <coughs> the submission's uploaded, it's ready to grade for the markers. Um, this one's finalized, but you have the, if it was, um, 
if it, if you left if there was a lot of time before the deadline, you could obviously resubmit as per usual. <coughs> This is the marker allocation, so you can allocate manually. Uh, there's also an option to be able to uh, run, um, automatically allocate uh, a proportion of papers to individual markers <coughs> rather than having to do it manually, uh, which is a bit more efficient. And this is the marker view, so the marker would, would, would come in. They cannot see the student name, uh, it says hidden. Uh, they can see the paper and they can uh, go in and grade uh, that paper. So if we click on the grade, they then get to the uh, marking screen and they can download the student paper. They can view the Turnitin uh, plagiarism reports. Um, and we've used a, a, a Moodle grade scale uh, so we can uh, enforce our common grading scheme. And then the markers can provide feedback either in that comment box to or uh, feedback or reason, uh, uh, explanation for their grade. Um, alternatively, they can download the PDF and mm -hmm. annotate it on the annotate on the PDF to provide feedback and upload that. Or if they were really keen uh, to stick with paper, uh, the other option is that they download the PDF, print it off, mark it on paper, scan it, and then upload it. But at least that's their own choice. That we're, we're not really advertising that one to them, but it's if you really want to, it's still there. So we, there's a lot of benefits compared to Turnitin. We can see um, which, uh, well, it's still going to Turnitin for pleasure and protection. Uh, if Turnitin's offline for whatever reason, then it's stored in, in our Moodle site, um, and that's a bit more something we've got more influence over compared to uh, Turnitin. And the, the papers would still go up to Turnitin whenever Turnitin decides to work again. We don't have file size limits. Uh, Turnitin is usually 20 megabytes, but obviously <coughs> when you're submitting big research papers with a lot of images, diagrams, or whatever, those file size can be quite big. And we don't want students to be unable to submit because of technical limitations. So we can actually just go by whatever the limit is from Moodle, and, and that. that relieve stress from students and it, we have the option of hiding or displaying the um, plagiarism score uh, which is uh, maybe not the best thing to display to students on a summative piece of work uh, it's probably something you'd want to talk about in a formative assignment and and only in a checkpoint and not on the on the final submission um, so the latest additions which we which were delivered in uh, January were the individual deadline extensions, submitting on behalf of the students so that um, if for whatever reason they're struggling, they can go and see uh, some registry staff to help them submit. Um, and an ability for our exam office to uh, download all the grades in the CSV files. Um, if, if they're not being uh, released to the students through Moodle, they can just download all, all the grades um, for, for, for the exam boards. Um, and also the ability to do sample marking and uh, group submission marking. So our plans in terms of what, what we see where we want to go with this is really to improve uh, the flow and save time for our exam office, our markers, um, uh, and there's a, a few things where we see uh, potentials for improving efficiency and, and time saving uh, with, some, with some small improvements. Um, and obviously, um, we want to get the feedback from our markers about the experience and what they see uh, they would need to make, make this uh, easier for them. And there was some interest in also automatically agreeing grades. Um, usually when, we, uh, when the two markers uh, mark separately, if the grade is uh, adjacent and within uh, the same band, so to speak, uh, as in uh, pass, um, um, distinction, or merit, if it's still within those bands and the grades are adjacent, in theory, the markers shouldn't need to agree a grade. It, it, that's just the biggest, the, the highest grade is, is meant to be that grade. They shouldn't have to come to an agreed grade. That's, that's taken out of the hand in theory. So, potential, potentials in that respect, and the ability to sort of copy the initial, the, the feedback from the initial marking into the final final. Uh, agreed grade uh, feedback. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, our current timeline with the pilot is 
um, as I said, 9th of March deadline and uh, May 2015 where um, is the deadline for the markets to mark all the papers. So we'll be reviewing the feedback from markets at that stage and telling everyone about it. Um, and that will allow us to then make a decision whether we can go paperless with um, our submissions from 2016 onwards for this specific assignment and find out about any additional requirements we, we can expect. Any, any questions? Thank you very much, Alison. I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions, but we probably don't have time for millions, but Alison's going to be here all day. But Ruth, did you want to kick off? Um, just two quick questions. Is it limited just to two assessors? Can you have more than two assessors? You, you can have one, two, three uh, uh, assessors, and you have the options of a single uh, of, um, sample marking. Is it only the option of? Sample marking. Okay. So you can only have and also, when each assessor fills in their feedback, can they then, can you make that visible to each other? Yes, so once, once they've both marked, they can't go back and edit their marks, but they can see each other's uh, marks for that. Marks and comments. And, and the comments, yeah. Okay, so thank you. Can you say it so? Because obviously, can you say it so it's hidden as well? So they can't see each other's comments. Um, it, it certainly um, is planned, it's certainly a previous version um, that we're working on did do that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure whether it's in the current version, but I can come back to you on that. Neil? In terms of feedback, presumably you could also go into turn in and use the grade mark too within that and do the feedback that way as well. You can, and we've been talking about this with the second uh, trial I was talking about, but obviously there's the big issue if you're trying to do double marking or triple marking, uh, a blind type of marking, then then that defeats the purpose because you can't do a double or triple marking in, in, in terms of you can, can do the other markers will automatically see the feedback you provide yeah. in grade mark, but you, technically you can. Other new? Yeah, you mentioned about start printing stuff out. Yeah. Um, yeah. How is, and this has been anonymized, if you've got a whole load of scripts that have been printed out, how are they actually marked up so you know the right, the right piece of work is linked to the student because you now have a random anonymous identifier? Is that actually printed out all the work? Is it manually added? Um, well, that's. That's really up to the market, I think. Um, they, we're not, so, as I said, we're not so encouraging them to pin it off. printing out, there's no way of actually automatically transferring that random identifier to the printer. There's, there's a random identifier that's available, yes. So, and is that that's part of it? Yeah, the, so, the, so as soon as you there. turn blind marking on, the random identifier is assigned to that student. When you turn it off again, they get their student names back on there, essentially. So, Break out anonymity. If if you wanted time. to turn it off, then yes, you could. But, um, well, I think I think what you're saying is, what can you actually get that um, uh, that identifier in the paper when you put it off? Oh, I see. It's it's um, not added to the file, no. Right. Um, but but yeah. we we just have an issue where we've just done a similar thing with, with 300 students, and then mm -hmm. finding out that staff have got 300 scripts, they have no idea right. who. Well, I, I think it can, if they were doing it on, on electronically on a computer or tablets, they would have the file name has yeah. is is that's the that's 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 identifier. That's big if we're actually your papers, and we don't really want to encourage them to print it off. Yeah. So it's kind of their own problem if they have to. They want to choose to print it off. Well, I'll do it that way. But it's something that could it may be their problem, but it could be resolved in a way of actually transferring that with, with file name. I mean, it is. This is for us. It's quite a deal. Because um, you know, it's not, you know, I'm unable to mandate that yes, you have to do it this way. We, we go as far as anonymization because we all have a number of policies we have to put this in place. Um, if you don't have to go the facts mm -hmm. It's a very good question, Neil. And um, because we're on version 1.0, that might come in later on into the tool. It just wasn't something that was identified in most of the versions that we worked on as, as a top topic to look at, um, but certainly we could consider it. It's nice to talk about um, later on maybe. Yeah. Peter, you've got a question? Yeah. 
<clears throat> well, thank you. It looks like a really great tool that we all have been waiting for for a long time. But um, in great mark, there were three different types of feedback. Uh, the quick mark library, general comments, and uh, rubric scorecard. So far, I could only see general comments being facilitated. What about the other two? So can you give, can you make corrections on the paper itself? On the, I suppose it's a PDF file. Yes, exactly. So the way we see it is it's a PDF file, so you download it, and we'll provide guidance uh, to staff on how to do PDF annotation, which essentially takes care of most of most of that. But it's true that there is some functionality which you don't have, as in the the, the quick mark library. You can't just drag a, a, a mm -hmm. existing comment onto it. Um, and I'm surprised there isn't something like that in, in the PDF annotated uh, field. Um, it's, it's one of the drawbacks, but there's certainly other positives. Yeah. So and the rubric scorecard? Um, yeah, it integrates with um, all, all the grading scale types, uh, everything that Moodle does mm. in regards to the grading side, <coughs> it does as well, just like any other activity type that Moodle it uses. I have a couple of other points. Uh, the first one is sort of probably not related, but uh, Turnitin is not a plagiarism detection service. And we need to move away from that one and say, our staff are a plagiarism detection service. It's just a tool to a system. Um, but I'm thinking about scalability in two senses. One, you suggested that you're going you're gonna to go paperless with a process that involves some level of administrative staff that are setting stuff up and, uh, and then the teaching staff just come and interact in the marketing sense. I'm thinking you might need to rethink that because the administrative staff can have big workloads when you go total papers and the teaching staff can actually do their own annotations or they can in assignment to. And the other um, scalability is file type. Uh, I'm not quite sure where you're, where you're working with, what you're working with, but we wouldn't get away with just saying PDF. I think mean, we have video submissions, we have um, Word, we have uh, math stuff, you know, we've got all sorts of file types coming in. So thinking that we can have to use a tool that is only going to. There's no limitation on the file type. I'd just say PDF for the annotation side of things, but you, you can restrict it if you want. There's an option there for you to say only this file type. But you, you have no practical limitation. The only limitation you have is if you want to send it to turn it in for, similar, for similarity reports. Turnitin has its own limitations, so that, that's the only limitation you might have to consider. But the tool in itself has no limitation in terms of file types. It just takes a file and, and de delivers it to the marker, essentially. Uh, so, so you don't have any limitation on that side. Um, uh, and for the admin side of it, for us, um, it, it's compared to dispatching paper, loads of paper to uh, in letters to the markers, uh, actually doing it uh, this way saves the admin a lot of time. So, so that so far we haven't had too much concerns of it with, with that approach. I was just going to add the RBC is very small, and um, also Alistair and his colleague Ben have put back two years worth of planning into it. So it, it's definitely something that will work for him, but appreciate the comments might not fit larger institutions. No. One of the challenges we found with the, the normal assessment tool within Moodle is that it you can't view grades and feedback without editing it. So, for example, if you want to give access to something to an external examiner mm -hmm. to see the grades and all the feedback that's been given, the only way you can do that is to give them full editing rights to the entire Moodle area. Mm -hmm. Is that addressed? Yeah, if you only to all of the feedback. Uh, a lot of the permissions on this are very customizable. Uh, you can you can be very granular in terms of what. Uh, in terms of defining a rule and what you want to do, and and that's what we've done with with the RBC uh, markers, and we've been tweaking that along as we go lately uh, to make sure we've got the exact workflow working in the way we want it, and both um, uh, giving our, our uh, exam office the right kind of access. Okay, well, so, I'm going to pause it there. So thank you so much to Alistair for, for demonstrating. It's always nice to hear from one of us rather than one of them, um, but for Richard for, for leading that session. So we're going to take a break, grab, grab a cup of tea or coffee outside the doors. But then
thank you all very much. Hope you've had your fill of tea and coffee. After all, our institutions sort of pay for it, kind of. Um, I'm going to hand <laughs> over to Emily now. Um, as you know, it looks after help desk and support and, and upgrades and all that sort of thing. And this, this session is an hour. And Emily won't be speaking for an hour. I might. You never know. You won't. <laughs> no, I won't. <laughs> uh, she's, but she's obviously got some really important things to tell us about, but it's a really good opportunity to, for questions and answers as well. So, Emily, over to you. Hi there. I think it's still morning. I think we're just before lunch. Um, before I get going, I see a lot of new faces here, and I just wanted to get a kind of um, a poll of uh, who's actually been involved in a major upgrade process with your CC. Um, over the last couple of years, because I'm not sure everybody has, but I just wanted to get a poll of hands. That's a good spread, good spread, wonderful. Um, what I'm going to do today is just go through, um, again, a little bit about our uh, uh, upgrade process for this next release, um, uh, some more information. So apologies if I repeat myself in terms of things that you already know, but I think it's a good opportunity to go through the process. Um, uh, and it enables us to make some questions on that afterwards. And also just to give you an overview of some of the major changes um, that are coming um, in the new version 2.8, because there are some major changes that I think you need to be aware of and start planning for with your end users um, when you adopt this release. Uh, so I've gone through that in terms of what we're going to discuss. So um, an email went out last week, um, just sort of officially saying we are now ready or just about ready to release uh, the next version um, of Moodle and our build, the Bloom build. Um, that one is going to be it's going to be officially available from the end of this month, um, and we are going to make available the code to any of our customers that are currently on tailored service, so that if they want to actually pull down the code that we've got, our build, they can use that if they've got local environments, or they can, if they're paying for test and dev environments from ourselves. Um, they can start going with that and if they want to work with their own developments. Um, I'll be sending out an email to all the tailored customers um, just to say how to get in contact, how to get access to our code um, after this meeting, um, just because uh, they may not have GitHub accounts um, and other ways of them getting access to that code. Um, if you don't have a test and dev environment and you want to get access, then obviously you can speak to us about um, the kind of services that we offer um, to allow you to get access to our code. Um, a bit more to have a look at that. Um, all the emails, um, any questions you have, we do appreciate that um, to come into the Moodle Upgrades inbox. Apologies to anybody that did try to email on the Friday. I got told on the Monday that there was a problem with the email address, but that's all sorted now. Everything that has been sent through has been recorded, um, and my colleague will be getting back to people that have already um, emailed in the next couple of days. Um, as per last year for the major upgrades, we are going to be running them Monday to Thursday during business hours. Um, because of the way that we've uh, uh, adapted our upgrade process, we can run more than one upgrade a day. What we're going to do, um, and what um, on here is, last for the uh, quarterly updates, where we were actually putting you in a maintenance mode, we did make a uh, open Google Calendar, and some of the feedback from the last user group was that they really wanted to still have an email as well, um, as well as having the calendar for visibility of what's been booked. So we're going to do the two-pronged attack in terms of making sure that when it's booked, it's, a vi it's visible on the calendar, so you can see that there's still free slots, but also there's going to be the interaction with um, my colleagues who will be managing the inbox for Moodle upgrades, sending you information. Um, the other um, uh, uh, that's going to be coming out is that we're going to notify you about, as per last year, about the status of third-party plugins. I'm going to cover that later in the um, uh, presentation, um, but there are currently a few unsupported plugins that are going to be affected in the next release. So on your tables, there's a start of the release notes. They will be sent out if you don't have a, a physical copy. They're going to be made available as well as a, pu a plug new plugin matrix for the versions that are going to be supported in the Bloom build from the 30th. That will be updated on a regular basis because as we found with last year with this sort of major upgrades, um, some of the uh, third party maintainers, they won't have updated some of their plugins till later on in the year around June time. And we'll be putting a plugin status where those are affected. So that might, um, uh, 
uh, convince you maybe to look, have a later upgrade or if you're not affected then you can book that in earlier. As per last year, we will contact you two weeks before to give you the new IP ranges for your new infrastructure to support your upgrade. Um, this has always been something that in the last two years, because we've wanted to maintain the process that we have in place, it is the one thing that we require from yourselves to make the upgrade run smoothly. Um, it's mainly so that you can make sure that your MIS teams, your uh, the LDAP, anything you do use for authentication, that you can get through the firewalls for the new the new um, VM that we're going to put your infrastructure on. Um, if you've got any questions about that, if you're new to the process, you can come through to me, you can come through to the Moodle Upgrades team, but we tend to use the email communication to come through and, uh, and, and talk to you about that. Um, one of the other things as well is to make sure that when you have booked the, the day of your upgrade that you do have the sufficient staff if there are any issues. So things like with, if there's a problem with the firewall, that you've got contact details, that there's someone available. Um, and that means from 9.30 to 5.30. Even though it may well be that the upgrade, your site's released back to you earlier in the day, it's good to make sure that you've got those staff in place um, for the upgrade. Additionally, although I haven't given out the release notes for Mahara, I can let you know that we'll be supporting 1.10 as well from um, the uh, end of this month. It's always good to go back to what we mean by read-only. Now, everybody, hopefully, as we've got a good show of hands, are aware of what we do in terms of the upgrade process. And if you're not, then do come and ask questions after I've done the presentation. Um, about what we do. So when we're actually performing an upgrade, we're essentially put, putting a, a doing an upgrade on a new infrastructure while your live site is still visible to your end users. However, they can't edit the site. They basically can view, they can interact in terms of downloading material, but they can't edit. Um, I've put a little um, chart here. Um, the main thing which is the turn it in assignments which unfortunately we do have to restrict access to so that is the that is the main issue um, that came out from last year and the year before because of the capabilities um, but it does allow you to have minimal downtime to your end users so they still have access to a system even though it obviously had restricted um, uh, uh, interactions now one of the things that came out from uh, last year when we uh, uh, chose to do the upgrades, we made um, a, an announcement that we were going to truncate some of the log files uh, uh, because of one, it was uh, for performance <coughs> and the second was to actually enable us to run upgrade process in a, in a, in a quicker way because the bigger the log table, the longer it takes us to restore and take backups of the site. We've taken on board that a lot of the, especially with HE institutions, we really can't do that because it's being used by your end users, there's been impact in terms of the conditional activities, um, for reporting, um, through the front end. Um, so what we're going to do is that we've taken that on board, we're going to still offer that you can have a maximum of a year after the point of the upgrade, so that your academic year is not affected by having the, um, for your log files. Ideally, we still want to work to, at one point, having only three months on the log, but that is a work in progress, so we've taken that on board and we're, we're adapting our upgrade process um, from there. Just go through there. Um, going back to what we do with the upgrade, once the upgrade is complete, we then go through the process of switching over. This is where there is an element of downtime. It's about 15 to half an hour. So essentially there's 15 minutes, half an hour, where users can't access the site, where we're switching over to the new upgraded site. So this is the bit, the meaty bit in terms of the major changes that are coming in play in the new release. Now, I don't know if you're aware, um, but from 2.7, Moodle decided to drop most of the legacy themes. So there used to be like about 12 or 13 um, additional themes in core. From 2.7, um, they've decided only to support two core themes, clean and more. Um, we've made the decision that we don't want to support some of the legacy themes as well, mainly because actually Moodle's gone quite far ahead in terms of having responsive themes for your end users, so we want to adopt that, we want to basically support that. 
So from the new build, we will only we will be replacing anybody that's on Bloom or Bonsai with um, a with the morphine configured with your logo and colour scheme. Anybody that's currently paid for a bespoke theme, um, they've got tailored service, private theme, or they've actually paid for maintenance <coughs> of the theme by ULC, we'll move those across as we did last year. Um, if you want to discuss about theming, you just need to come speak to me, um, Richard or, or Dave afterwards, uh, if you want to uh, um, answer more questions about that. Um, but we will also be sending anybody that's affected by that, where you actually do have one of the old custom legacy themes um, that you'll be moving across to the new theme. I personally think it's a way for the way forward because you're getting a better a better theme, a better responsive theme for your end users. But that is a major change that you're going to have to look at in terms of um, for your end users. It's going to look different um, uh, if you are on the Bloom or Bonsai um, service. We have also decided to put two more configurable themes in to give people that don't have a theme designer, you know, in their institution, they can't pay for theming um, uh, for a specific. There are two configurable themes that are going to be added to the build. Um, Essential, which was added last year, but we're also putting BCU um, uh, in there. They're configurable by admins. You can put in um, your logos, your colour schemes, you can put banners in, and that can be all done from the front end for the end user. So it just gives a bit more of an option um, if you are not in a position to pay for theming um, uh, as an institution. Filters. Um, 2.8 includes MathJax, which is fantastic, because I think people have been wanting that if they're, uh, they're, they're doing sort of their uh, scientific calculations. Um, however, what we have chosen to do is remove the Wirris filter. Um, we chose to, for coding reasons, that we're, we don't think that that's supportable anymore. Um, there's only a couple of customers affected by that, but we will con contact them. Um, it's not used widely. Um, but I thought I should note, note that here in case anyone has any questions about that. Now this is a biggie because I don't know if people have picked this up yet. Um, the new editor, so this is a custom built editor by, the, by Moodle um, uh, that replaces the, the old tiny HTML editor. Now one of the things that I've seen in the forums over the last couple of months is that it doesn't as standard come with the resizing text and changing font colour. That might seem like a, a small thing, but for your end users, that's going to be a big change. Now, in 2.8, you can still have the tiny HTML editor. You can change that. So that is going to be a decision that you're going to need to look at um, for your end users, um, because they have to strip away that functionality in 2.8 onwards. I think there'll be a few questions about that afterwards. The other major change is the logging system. Now. At the moment, uh, the uh, log you just have one log. From 2.8, they're actually introducing a new logging system within Boodle. You'll have your old legacy log and a new logging system. For your end users, they're not going to notice any difference. What it will mean is that if you maintain some of your, old, um, your own code, you do need to rewrite your plugins to use the new <coughs> logging system. Um, it's a work in progress in terms of the Moodle roadmap. Um, they're moving towards having the ability to have new log stores, your own personal log stores for plugins and activity to report on, so that you don't essentially have one massive log table for every activity. It's a work in progress. You will see a difference because you will see when you go into logging, you'll have the legacy log and you'll have the new log. Um, some elements of plugins will be writing to the legacy log. Some newer written plugins will be writing to the new log. So if you're a developer, I think that's one of the things that you'll need to be aware of. Um, for this version, we're going to run both of those together because Moodle hasn't actually fixed on what they're doing in terms of the new logging system. But if you are writing your own plugins, you will need to, be able, need to look at that in terms of the event management, which is a new, new tool in 2.8, because you may well want to set up events against the new log system in terms of what plugins are being written to that. Again, I'll be sending out new stuff on the blog about this with more detail. Um, it's quite a, a big chunk of change, um, probably too much to describe in a, in a user group, but we will be putting more information up about the logging. I mentioned briefly about the events monitoring. This is a really powerful new tool. 
Um, and I think it's going to be something that everybody's going to want to start looking at in terms of what is um, possible um, so that you can actually set up events. Um, it will message you, it will email you, you can do things via cron tasks to set up so that you get mail shots for particular activities. Um, so it's a very powerful tool. Um, I would invest some time in looking at that in terms of when we're talking about reporting. Now, as with all our major upgrades, when we're going through um, from March, um, we do have some plugins that are not ready yet. They're not actually in a, in a position where they have tested it with 2.8 and actually said, yes, it works. What we try to do is mitigate that by obviously going to the latest version of that plugin. We've been doing our testing on the plugins that are included in the build. So things like OU Blog, OU Wiki that come in as core. They all work, but they haven't actually been confirmed to work with 2.8. We will let you know the plugins that haven't actually got a version yet so that you can make sure. Not everybody's affected because it depends on the, uh, the smaller plugins. Um, but the main one is mod subpage, which I know Burbeck uh, uh, have, have, have known about for a while and have put in some development to mitigate that so that they're not affected. Um, it's not widely used um, throughout the customer base, but the Open University decided that they weren't going to maintain that as an um, activity um, anymore. Um, so that will be dropped um, from our build um, from 2.8. So if you want to, if you are affected by that, then do come and speak to us. Um, we've done a piece of development with Burbeck, which I'm sure uh, Leo is happy to talk about, uh, um, to, to mitigate that if you were using the subpage. Um, the other thing is if you are um, using proprietary plugins, so this really affects the tailored services, um, people that are actually doing their own development. If you work with Blackboard, Equella, um, I actually do contact most of the other proprietary to say, have you got a version ready for 2.8? What's your um, ske schedule for that? Um, I've been in um, discussions with Equella about their roadmap. But you do have, I know Sarah, in fact, has quite a lot of um, like Campus Pack and Blackboard. You do need to start those discussions with your account managers about making sure when those versions are going to be ready so that you can plan when you want to do the major upgrade. We're going to put a list every week. I'm also going to be putting blog posts up about the plugins, you know, specific ones that are really important to all of you guys that use. Um, it's one of the things that came out from the user group, more and more and more information on what kind of plugins, because what you don't want to happen is that you've organized an upgrade and then you find out, actually, there's uh, we've got 100 courses using a particular activity and it's not ready yet, or it can't be, it's not compatible in terms of the new version release. We will also, I have put some dates, oh, excuse me, um, for the quarterly releases. So I've been talking about the major upgrade, but just to give you an indication on here, this is a timeline for the whole year in terms of the updates. These are the, the smaller incremental updates. These aren't the major upgrades. These are the ones that if you went through in November, November, December, these are the type of updates. What we're currently exploring is ways of minimizing the downtime for those because they are done in situ. So they're either updating Moodle so 2.8.5 to 2.8.6, or there are some bug fixes, some security patches. What we're trying to do at the moment is look at, one, decreasing the time, because we were fitting those in within our um, at-risk period between seven and nine. We're looking about hours options, and we're working on that. And as throughout the year, I'll be updating on the blog, um, user groups to let you know how we're progressing with that to make those, those less intensive that you, then hopefully you won't notice that we're updating. I rushed through that, hope, uh, hopefully, but um, uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions. So, um, yeah. please. Um, any questions online, Liam? Uh, I think no is answer. Yeah. Good. Uh, and is it possible to archive logs somewhere? It is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We can truncate the logs, or if you're buying other services, um, you can actually <coughs> download those, put a new database. Um, if Whoever, uh, I don't know who it is that put the notice, they want to get in touch, we can, we can tell you about the options available. And then how do you access Google Calendar? There is a link through here. 
It's going to be sent um, on uh, the uh, demo site. It's going to be available on the portal and on the blog. Uh, I think I've actually put it in the blog already with a link. If not, I'll make sure that it's in there by the end of today. Just one more. Um, did you say the OU blog does work in Moodle 3.8? It does at the moment, but they haven't confirmed that it is the official um, it's supported. So that's one of the things is that just keeping you in the loop, it does actually, it works fine, we've tested it, but it is that element that where we've got third party contributed plugins in our build, some of the developers don't update it to later on in the year. So it's that official, um, this, this is supported. Okay, thank you. So we'll come back to our virtual delegates later and I'll take a question from the front. Neil, did you have one? Yeah, Emily, is there a, a reverse roadmap for how long <laughs> previous versions will be supported? Yes, um, um, in the release notes, um, there's a, on the first page, um, we are supporting 2.6 to the end of the year um, uh, because from May it's only security. But we've actually been speaking to Mark in terms of the roadmap for the 2.6, but we will be contacting anybody on <coughs> earlier versions later on in the year if they haven't upgraded to 2.8 to work with them to actually bring them in line with the current build that we've got. Joe, did you have a question? Yeah, that the tiny MCE editor would be available, or we yes. can keep it in 2.8. It is available in 2.8, but it's not the default editor anymore. So they've introduced Atto, and so that uh, when you upgrade, that is then the default. You can change it. You can change it further on than 2.8. I don't I think know at this stage. I mean, I've, I've, I've asked my crystal ball. I think they probably <laughs> drop it in a couple of version releases. I haven't seen that there's there's been quite a lot of forum activity about you know why did you do this and um, their developers have said well actually we do it for accessibility reasons. That's why you can't change the colour of things. But they're saying well. Our, our lecturers, this is one thing, you know, we don't want them to go back and cut and pasting from Word and other things. So I don't know at this stage. What, what will happen to things that have already had the colours and the sizes mm. set? I would imagine they'd upgrade. be set because it puts it in an HTML code underneath. Um, yeah. Okay, moving back to the next table, Neil. Um, uh, the 15 to 30 minutes uh, downtime. Um, but what's, what's the typical read-only time? Um, actually, we are reducing that time every year. It depends on the size of the institution. So it can be as little as two hours, or it can be the full day. It really does depend on the size of the institution. Can we help find the day when we can afford to have that system read-only? Because I don't know that within our institution, we don't have to go and find that day because we've got academic staff you know, the deadlines or whenever they want them. So. Mm. Well, we, we, norm we normally take guidance from yourselves in terms of the dates that are available for you within your academic calendar. We have found with lights other institutions it's, be it's becoming harder and harder because teaching uh, exam periods, they you know, you've got sort of summer, summer courses and it is becoming more of a, um, a, a difficulty to run those in those Core but I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you meant, can ULCC assist and look at your usage stats to see oh. when is a quieter time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we can we can certainly provide those statistics. Quiet. So if you want to email me, I can uh, I can give you. Obviously, being very rigid in, in the time, <coughs> daytime only, if this can take yeah. place, is, is there any way out of that? Um, there time? is. We do offer, if you want to discuss with us, the opportunity to look at out of hours, but it do, it's not something that we do as standard. So we would do it as a, as a separate um, uh, thing, but you can come talk to me. As a large institution, I think we're not going to be looking in a couple of hours. Um, you know, I think some will be in contact anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. Going to the second point in integration, and are you already in doing any testing? We'll be talking to the guys at Campus M at all. Um, I haven't actually, no, I haven't actually had much of a discussion with Campus M. Um, they have access to the code, but um, I don't know what they're doing in terms of the uh, the mobile app. Um, Sarah, are you I'm aware looking, of it? I'm looking for Alistair and I can't see him, so maybe. Sorry, uh, oh, um, we've looked at the new plugin. We're going to the next release build. We have uh, Plymouth aren't currently on our build anyway, so um, effectively, the new plugins can go in and make it improved. That's what we're asking. Well, at the moment we do. You don't. 
Yes, we do. You do? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I'm saying that the, the new one is the, uh, they recently released a narrow festival. Yeah, but that's what I'm asking about is the, is, is the compatibility between that and 2.8. Oh, I see. Uh, we haven't done any testing on that. Specifically, we've tested the plugins in the plugin player, but we haven't tested the plugins in the plugin player. I think it's something that we can probably take out of this meeting as well, so I'm not sure how many other. Sorry. I'm not sure if the council discussion is being picked up, so it's all right if we, we move on and maybe you guys can talk about that because it is important. Um, going back to your out of hours um, question, Neil, I know that was something that as a user group we were trying to lobby these guys to look at evening upgrades and weekend upgrades, <coughs> which would be other providers do that for other services, and that's something that we would look to you guys to do. And I know you put a line at the bottom on the previous slide that's mm -hmm. something you're, you're looking at. So is there anything else that we can do to say we really want that and that's important? Just saying you really want it here. This, yeah. is, the, this is the best opportunity. Yeah. 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 Okay, it's been noted. If any ULCC people can say that away. Um, sorry, okay. Uh, yeah, question from the front. Uh, I know I've got an invitation to the um, December upgrade. Does it happen in the background or are we still working some? Um, it was sent out. There was a mail shot that was sent out and we were doing them, so I'm not sure if you didn't, I'll, I'll double check, <laughs> I would have thought that you might have been done. Um, it was quite a low, low impact update. That's it. Yeah? Uh, when you do the upgrades, are you including just particular fixes or are you actually moving the entire point release? Uh, the current build is on 2.8.5 and uh, the, I think June we'll update that again. So we will be doing the whole yeah, I know, I, actually, I remember the question you said where we were cherry picking in the, we won't be doing that. That was only because it was the first time. Yeah, it was just for the December. Um, it's unlikely we'll do that again. We will just move up to the next incremental version. So 2.8.5 is what we're on at the moment. It, yes. And the next one, one will be the big one. No, June. June. June, what version is that going to be? I, it will be the next one up, I think, unless, okay, they, they, unless they choose to put some more security. So, okay. okay, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, good question. I don't know if it's a block or a plugin. Uh, will um, Office 365 be 2.8? It's currently in our development backlog where we're reviewing it. I've seen a lot of community in the tracker about people mm -hmm. testing it, um, and I know that there's been some uh, debate about. I remember three or four years ago when there was the Office 365, or I've forgotten what it was called in the previous in inventions about the authentication workflow in terms of what you can use. Um, it is still being actively developed. I don't think it's mature enough yet, but we are we have added it to our backlog. It's unlikely for this release, but it's quite possibly, depending on when we review it, that it will go into later releases. That's a good question, actually, with Office 365, because I know that some of my colleges are really interested in looking at it, so it's something that we can talk about at mm -hmm. another meeting and explore that further. Some uh, we're looking at it over the next couple of weeks, so we, we should have a decision. So, did that get picked up, Lynn? No, so in the next few weeks, you'll see people looking more at Office 365. Excellent. Uh, yeah, back to Joe. Um, what Google plugins will there be? Because at the moment, we can get to Google Drive when you're doing the file picker, mm -hmm. but we used to connect straight to Gmail with single sign-on. Is that coming back, or the block for Google Documents and Calendar? There is. Um, I think they've actually adapted. I'll have to double-check. I'll come back to you, Joe, about the, what's in core, but the old Google Apps integration, no, that's still not in our build. Um, but they have actually... A, had been developed that were coming in with 2.0. I think there is, yes. Um, I think it's in the release notes that the Google Drive bit is is better. Um, but I don't think it's the single sign-on that you have before. I'll come back to you. Actually, Google Drive is another thing I would be quite interested in seeing how that integrates with Moodle. So I think that's something else that we can look at for the next meeting. Um, I saw a hand go up. Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, as an admin, will I be able to set a standard colour and size for the regular text and for the headings for the whole site? Yes. <laughs> Good. That's simple. Anything else? 
Okay. Oh, yeah. Going back to where I started from, if we kept, if if things are coming over and they're going to stay formatted with colours and different size fonts, and then somebody adds something else to the fonts, it's going to look different, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a big. It's a big change. It's a big change. I think. They've made the decision, and um, I think you, what you do have, have to go back to your end users is look at the impact and, and make a decision whether or not you want to adopt a new editor. One of the things that you need to be aware of is that the Moodle community is now only developing the filters, the extensions to that editor for Atto. You know, and it will become it is a it will become the tiny HTML will become more and more of a legacy tool. So, like with the subpage where you've been using, say maybe say you're using it for a couple of years. This is now kind of like highlighting that you're going to have to either have an exit plan because it is a core element, or you go down a tailored route and you decide that you're going to have your, you know, maintain your own editor for the various reasons. I am aware that some of the developers are looking at extensions to Atto so that you can do changing the text size, um, but it's not in core at the moment. Have you set the default to course level, or is it site level? It's site level. It's not going. I don't. I'll have to come back to you, but I think it's site level. They're still on the same thing. If is there a way of saying we want everything to be reset to use the standard Atto format? It's a good question. I'll have to come back to you though, with that one. No, I don't. These are, these are actually really good questions yeah. because they're, they're the sort of things. Although we're so supporting the upgrade, but things that change in Moodle, we want to obviously highlight any changes so that you can go back and be. Um, uh, knowledgeable to your end users about what's happening. And Emily will come back with those answers in a blog post, won't you, Emily? I will. So, so we all know what the answers are to, to the question, so thank you. <coughs> yeah, yeah, just to follow on from that one, actually, I, mean, I, I can certainly, having seen what some of our users do with coloured text, I can certainly see the rationale for getting rid of some of it. Mm. But um, is it possible in the new editor, do you know, to have like a set of Headings or pre-formatted things, so that you know, like, so heading one is this size and color, heading two, heading three. I think that still exists. It's yeah. it's it's just the basically some of the functions that you had in the tiny HTML have just been removed. It's very grey yeah. for accessibility. Roman in white green is yeah. probably not <laughs> good anyway. So yeah. I think they've still got the heading drop down, but yeah. it's not. It's just the ability to resize by the by the drop down. Just want to check, Liam. Are there any questions online coming through? Um, no, nope, we're good. I was just wondering because we've got a little bit of time before lunch. So, do you want to just spend the next sort of five or seven minutes talking to the people on your tables, having a chat discussion about what you've heard um, Emily talking about in terms of the upgrades, and then we'll come back and see if there are any other questions before we finish for lunch. So. Do you want to do that now for the next five or seven minutes? And those with you online, feel free to chat amongst yourselves as well. It's interesting. There's not much opportunity for people to, to have this chat because then what we've got to we've got Toby doing things about integrations and alternatives and we might need extra time back. I don't think she's coming to here. No, she's not coming till after but for lunch I think because um, I think she was coming in between half okay. time so she'll be she'll waiting right. to come in. <laughs> Somebody else to speak to. Oh, really? <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's good that it's come from Peter's mouth, not that you're here All right, are there any other questions now that you've had a, chat, a chance to talk amongst yourselves that might have generated some more concerns or questions or anything else for Emily? Anything else? I've just I've just learned about the um, adopter plugin thing. So uh, apparently a plugin is for life, not just for Christmas. Emily, tell us more. I was just I was I was mentioning that um, over the last year, I think the Moodle community, because there are a lot of plugins that sub, you know the maintainer decides I just haven't got the time to keep moving at the pace that Moodle is. Um, and if you go onto Moodle.org, there is actually I've forgotten his name, apologies, but one of the um, uh, the developers from Moodle. There is a sort of initiative where you can adopt a plugin, so you can say, "I want to take the maintenance of this." You know, I'm happy to take that on. And I think that's one of the things. Maybe you need to obviously speak to us as well, um, because we're always happy to do development and take, you know, 
if there's enough impetus from the uh, from the group for some of the plugins. Um, it's always um, going to be an issue with open source, where um, there's a fantastic tool, it's great for a couple of versions, you know, then the maintainer goes, oh, I'm going on to something else, um, and then it's widely used, and then what do you do with that? Because it's not in core, but it's used as a group. Um, and um, I think Moodle have, in the last couple of years, realized that there are a lot of plugins that may be, be falling behind the scenes because the maintainers moved on to something else. Um, so they're actually actively, you know, engaging with saying like get, look, adopt a plugin. Um, um, but yeah, I just told Sarah about that, and I, I don't know how many of you are aware. But of I thought that was great, and that's something again that we could maybe work on together as a community. Maybe we could kind of crowd fund ULCC to maintain a plugin that we're all using. And the way that I would manage that is that we use the email distribution list because you're all on that mailing list. That's so true. if there's a plugin that your institution is heavily using but the third party developers uh, have left doing something else maybe becoming flower rangers i don't know but you need you need it and that's something we can we can share the load of um i think it came up one of my colleges is dependent on the ou for plugins and the ou's upgrade policy isn't until they don't do it till june yes which is a june. little bit yeah. late for us and it's a bit risky knowing if things that we depend on the ou for but you know as you say if it's the open source thing and we kind of sign up to that and it's at a risk that we use these there third-party plugins, but, um, yeah, Ruth. Just on that idea, those institutions like that which have developers able to do that because they have options for working in partnerships <coughs> uh, Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Lucky you for having developers. We, we don't have any, many. Neil. I wonder whether there's any scope for this group acting as a, a, a voice back to the Moodle community more widely for when things get taken out of mm. core because I'm conscious and I can't remember offhand what it was but I know there was something we were looking at which um, we, we knew had been in a previous version and then had gone out in I think 2.3 mm. and it's like you know is there any greater strength of, of this group acting as a kind of so not quite the UK HE and FE Moodle community, but a big chunk of it, mm -hmm. to go back to the community and say, actually, taking that the editor, if that is a major issue, mm -hmm. out is going to cause a number of problems yeah. rather than 15, 20, 30 separate institutions doing it or maybe not doing it. I think there is definitely scope for that. It's, yeah. it's about having that sort of communication channel back to Moodle community. Um, the uh, I was just going to say... Um, at the moment, we are in a position where we can push things in tracker, we can be involved in the developer. I mean, I don't know how many of you are involved in the developer meetings, they're all open. Um, we have our developers on those when they're looking at what their, their roadmap are. Um, that's a good opportunity. So um, they do have those meetings on a regular basis where I think they're just sort of webinars, Adobe Connect type sessions, where they all sort of talk around what their roadmap are. Is this something that's sort of lobbying Moodle? Yeah. Is that something that ULCC can do on our behalf? Do you have a strong enough voice? I'm looking at Richard as well mm -hmm. with Moodle HQ, or is it something that we would do independently of you? Effectively, it's based on the number of folks. So ULCC is an folks based on staff, so we can make I can vote and we can vote. So it's best to use our email distribution list for the group if there's something that is on the voting wish list thing and then you just encourage everyone to vote. That's, that seems a sensible way forward because that's where we get the biggest number of hits. Excellent. Good. Anything else that came up in your discussions or anything else that you want to collectively ask about upgrades? No, okay. I've noticed that some of Emily's team are at the back there. Before they dash, I don't know if you want to wave and say hello, um, but it, it's nice to see you guys in person other, rather than at the end of a, an email. So, um, so there's Jackie and Parthi at the back there. Jackie in the pink, Parthi in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so we would like to say a collective thank you to the work of you guys at the back for keeping our Moodles alive, so thank you. Um, excellent. Okay. Well, I think we can probably pause there and have some lunch, which will be hopefully now served outside. Um, and we'll be coming back in here at 1.15 for Toby's presentation. So thank you all very much. Thank you to Emily. That was great.
It's all right, Jaguar is so. Okay, ladies and gents, I make it quarter past one. Do you make it quarter past one, Dave? Almost. Uh, my watch must be a bit fast. Oh, yeah. 13 past. 13 past. So I never miss a train. Okay, cool. Thank you. So we've got a couple of sessions this afternoon, a couple of presentations. Shortly, I'm going to hand over to Toby, who's an account manager at ULCC. Is that the right title? Um, he's going to tell us a bit about integrations with other systems institutions customers have um, and then after Toby I'll be handing over to Caroline who's come here from Turnitin at the last user group meeting there was a lot of discussion about Turnitin and Turnitin next what was happening so to address that we've invited um, a representative from there to come along if you do have to leave early this afternoon I hope that you don't but if you do there's an evaluation form on your table is that right Noah is that right? I can't see. But there will be evaluation forms. If you could complete that, that's really helpful for me and for the rest of the team to know what worked, what didn't, and we can feed it all into the next session. So without further ado, I shall hand over to Toby. Thank you. Um, first of all, I hope uh, everyone's had a very pleasant lunch. Um, so today uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about um, integrations. Um, to those of uh, you who I've had the chance to work with so far, uh, you probably know that I'm not really a technical expert, so with a little help from the team, um, in fact a lot of help from the team, we've managed to put this uh, presentation together. Um, so in the first diagram here, um, these are the eight core uh, integrations of Moodle, and running through these quickly, they include enrollments, uh, users, authentication, grades, submissions, courses, categories, and groups. And um, the most common well, integrations uh, which we offer and provide are listed here. So they are the Moodle external database, uh, extended databases, web services, grade binding, and DB sync. So uh, on to the Moodle external database. Um, this is a core Moodle tool which uh, allows for integration as well as uh, with the well external database. Um, the staging uh, database in the middle contains an enrollments table and optionally uh, a course table for populating Moodle. The uh, options we have worked with for transport mechanism include uh, the customer making available the data through either a set of views, tables or files. Um, the enrollments table can be set up to map against any of the unique values but uh, must contain a unique identifier for the course the role and the user, such as a course short name and uh, user uh, usernames and role short names. And um, when enrollment disappears from the table, they can either be set to unenroll that user, keep the user enrolled, or disable the course enrollments and remove roles. Um, the course table must contain uh, the course full name, short names, course ID, and optionally the category if you are not using the default category. Uh, a course template uh, which can be set up for all new courses to uh, copy the content from. And adding to this, uh, we have also created a separate tool for Moodle which allows uh, for course creation and enrollment synchronization. It also caters for group creation, uh, group member addition, category creation and updates. Um, in this uh, scenario, a number of additional views, tables, and files are uh, all enabled for integration. Uh, Moodle looks at this local database and crunches the data similarly to uh, the external database. And, um, oh, sorry, with Moodle Web Services, um, this contains a number of functions that can be called in order to uh, do a number of predefined tasks. The uh, integration operates in this uh, sort of zigzag fashion following the arrows as shown in the diagram. Um, ULCC have increased uh, the number of web services available in summary courses, users, enrollments, groups, categories, etc., which uh, can all be read, created, 
and update it by calling given functions with its uh, parameters. And um, web services is uh, it's also a good way of retrieving data about particular items, as well as including um, available logs. It's uh, relatively easy to write a new web service if uh, one doesn't exist. Um, well, I guess I would struggle with that, but if your team has a, a developer on board, then this would be a really useful function. And um, Grave Binding is another integration which we have done for a few customers and is based around sending grades back for entry into uh, student record systems automatically. Um, in this system, the, the teacher or the lecturer creates an activity for students to submit to, and then the lecturer grades that activity. So when the lecturer is happy to send grades across uh, to the student record system, they choose from the ID number field within the settings of the activity and the assessment to uh, bind that activity to which is based upon the table view supplied uh, as part of the integration. These grades are then either made available for retrieving via a web service or are exported and made available for retrieval via a file uh, or a database table. And finally, um, ULCC have also created an integration so that uh, user accounts can be created and updated based upon the table review. And this allows for things such as changing um, email addresses and passwords, as well as configuring what happens when a user disappears from the table or view uh, to keep, suspend, or to delete. Um, the DB sync is a really good method uh, for those who are not currently using uh, LDAP for synchronizing accounts and instead are using alternative uh, authentication providers such as uh, Shibleth or CAS. And um, well, this is my really quick overview. <laughs> and if you do have any questions, um, you know, do contact the service desk. Or if you do have any questions now, my colleague Richard at the back will be able to help answer any questions. <laughs> Just a good overview of how all the systems work together. I've heard the